You need to come to today's lab, right? And then next week, we're going to turn in lab notebooks after the third lab. So you want to make sure that you have your first and your second labs written up, completed. You should have them completed if you did them in lab. You don't need to rewrite them. You don't need to type them, right? Um, just put them in, an, in a lab notebook in order, and then make sure you have your name on everything, and then you're going to turn it in after lab. And then you'll get it back in the next lab, okay? So just make sure that you bring your lab and get it all put together if you haven't done that um, for next week. Are there any questions about the lab notebooks? <coughs> no. Okay, so we were talking about organic molecules. And something interesting happened yesterday um, related to molecules. And that is, is that we had um, uh, the Nobel Prize winners introduced. And the Nobel Prize winners um, for chemistry were those that actually created nanotechnology, which are these tiny little machines that are composed of molecules that can do work. So essentially, they can move. And so um, if we look at, um, I thought I had this linked here to my video. Oh, I had a video. Let's see. Dang it. Sorry, I thought I had a picture and a video. Here it is. Okay. So this should kind of look familiar to you. Because you can see here, we'll squeeze, okay. So you can, we have to look at those ads. <laughs> so you can see here that these are individual atoms. And so this is a molecule. And so they were able to synthetically produce these molecules that actually move. So if we look at um, a little video, short video clip of one, okay. And let's start it from the very beginning because it moved off the screen, okay. So that's what a little machine looks like. So it's interesting that we're able to synthetically produce these little machines. And so the hope is, is that you know, maybe with medicine, we can actually send these little molecular machine or machines into cells, so that it, into our body so that they can do work. Um, and um, we might be able to create um, synthetic products, like maybe fabric, that will change shape in response to being exposed to energy. So it's kind of science fiction. -y. But if we look at what is happening in our bodies naturally, I just want to point out that these molecular machines occur inside of our cells. And so I'm going to show you this little video that shows um, this is something that is inside of every one of your cells that helps to move substances around the cell. And so this is called a kinesin molecule. And it walks along a little rail track that is inside of your cell. So it kind of looks like this, right? Okay, so what this is, is this is part of your cytoskeleton. It's a protein. This is a protein that is transporting a vesicle of substance, and it could be transported to the outside of your cell and then secreted to the outside of your cell. So if we look at, I don't know what's going on with this one, let's see. Look at this one. Our brain is made of billions of nerve cells, and they're all connected. If we take a closer look, a nerve cell seems to have antennas. Most of them are receivers of information, but only one is a transmitter, called the axon. This axon is connected to several receivers of other cells, forming a gigantic neural network, the brain. Meet John. John is a kinesin, a motor protein. He lives inside a nerve cell, and he has a proper job. To ensure that a brain cell does his job properly, it needs the continuous flow of building materials, proteins, they travel through the cell using the cytoskeleton. If you compare a nerve cell with the city, the cytoskeleton inside the cell would be the rose, and the traveling proteins would be the traffic. These materials are towed by motors along the roads. And just as in real life, there are different kinds of motors and different kinds of roads. 
And John's sole purpose in life is to deliver his cargo to a specific place in the accident. He takes the main roads, and he walks in just one direction only. John's job may seem easy, but it's not. He has to overcome a number of obstacles to ensure that the right amount of cargo arrives at the right place. To make the journey even more difficult, John is not alone. Other motor proteins ride along with his cargo. They haven't woken up yet, but that will happen soon. The journey starts in the center of the city, just like in the center of the cell. To enter the axon, John has to pass a place called the axon initial segment. In this segment, there are two kinds of roads. The main roads that John uses, called the microtubules, and a lot of little alleys called actin. And here, our brave motor protein meets his first challenge, because one of his sleeping travel companions, myosin, has woken up and starts to cling to the actin. And there are a lot of alleys. Only brute force can save John now. Fate strikes again. The other companion, Dainen, wakes up, and he can only walk in the opposite direction of John, resulting in a tug of war. But there can be only one. Along the axon in which John travels, there are places called synapses. Here, the axon connects to receivers of the other cells, regulating proteins called the shots here. This traffic police makes sure that all passing traffic gets to the right destination. If John's cargo is needed in this synapse, he will be stopped and myosins take over his load. But today, John's cargo is safe. But what he does not know that his road is under construction, just a few blocks away. In our nerve cells, the cytoskeleton is changing constantly. Roads are built, but are also broken down. Facing this kind of obstruction, John has to find a detour. John isn't the only motor protein on the road. There are many more. Our nerve cells need a smooth traffic flow in order to perform well. A traffic jam due to problems during the journey may ultimately result in brain disease. Understanding the challenges John faces could improve treatment or prevention. Finally, John arrives at his destination. He has fulfilled his destiny. But several other Johns are just getting started. Okay. So that is molecular machines inside of our cells. And the example was the nervous tissue and the nerve cells or the neurons. Okay. So even though we're synthetically producing these little machines, we also already have these machines inside of us. Are there any questions about that idea of molecular machines? So the last major group of organic molecules that we need to talk about are the nucleic acids. And the nucleic acids, um, have a, let me see if I can find my, I have misplaced, sorry, I misplaced my marker that actually works. Actually, I didn't misplace it, somebody else took it probably. Okay, let me just, I'm going to be right back.
Okay. So when we think about nu nucleic acids, oftentimes we think of our genetic material. So the genetic material is composed of nucleic acids. And we know the genetic material has abbreviation, which is called DNA. And we're gonna talk about what DNA stands for and what makes up the molecule when we get to genetics. The other example, of a nucleic acid is ATP, right? So I mentioned before that ATP is a type of chemical energy. And so this is a molecule that stores energy. And this energy can be used anywhere in the body and in the cells. Okay, so if we look at ATP. ATP is composed of a nitrogenous base. Called adenine. So we talked about oops. Adenine. We talked about nitrogen previously in our cells because remember that the amino acids have an amine group and amine has nitrogen in it. And so the breaking down of um, ATP and the genetic material also produces nitrogen. So it's also a source of nitrogenous waste that we get rid of in our urine. Okay, so adenine is the nitrogenous base and then it is bound to three phosphate groups. So this is what is referred to as the triphosphate. <coughs> this last uh, bond here is very high energy. So remember that we talked about how we can store energy in covalent bonds. And then when we break them, that energy can be released, right? So oftentimes you see when we talk about ATP, a chemical reaction that looks like this. ATP get, can be converted, and this reaction can go in two directions, to ADP, which means we break off one of those phosphates and it becomes diphosphate. So this is adenine diphosphate instead of triphosphate plus a phosphate group plus energy right so energy is released and so for example muscle cells can contract right now if we look at it can go the other way that we can put energy into adp and produce more atp Right? So this is what we call stored energy or potential energy. So this is stored. We store ATP in our muscles, for example. And then we say that this is energy that is being used. And so this is kinetic energy. So it's energy that's doing work. So the conversion of ATP to ADP and then back again occurs continually in our body as we produce energy and use energy. Okay. So ATP is an example of a nucleic acid that stores energy. Now, if we look at the other, the genetic material, right? Um, oops. Oh, here's a diagram of ATP. So this is the adenine group and these are the phosphate groups. Okay. If we look at our genetic material, and so you probably know of the double helix, right? Our DNA is a double helix, and it's double stranded so that there's two strands to the molecule. These are my nitrogenous bases. Sometimes when they talk about DNA, they talk about the A's, C's, T's, and G's. And we're going to talk about that in detail. But what I wanted to show you is these bonds right here. So are those bonds, what type of bond is that? Hydrogen, 
right? So it's a hydrogen bond because it's a dotted line, right? And is it strong or weak? Weak, okay? So one of the really interesting things about our DNA is is that it easily comes apart. So the two strands of the DNA, because they're held together by hydrogen bonds, can easily come apart, and that in fact is how the DNA molecule make, makes a copy of itself. Where each strand serves as a template, and then you build the other strand so that you can produce more DNA, so that you're, you can produce more cells in your body. Okay. So um, DNA is an example of a nucleic acid that has kind of a complex structure that includes hydrogen bonding. Okay. So today we're going to get into cells, and we are specifically going to talk about a type of cell that is found in your body, which is called eukaryotic cells. And this is versus prokaryotic. Okay. So you notice that karyotic is common to both of those um, words, right? And kary means nucleus. So what is generally, what does pro mean? When you think of it as a root to a word, does it mean? It means before, right? So this is the, the prokaryotic cells lack a nucleus, but the eukaryotic you in terms of what that means, that means good nucleus, right? So the eukaryotic cells have a good nucleus. And the pro prokaryotic cells have no nucleus. So does anybody know what microorganism is composed of or it has prokaryotic cells rather than eukaryotic cells? What microbe? Think of wild gas. We think of microbe, what's do you think? So think of germs, and germs are what? What's a germ? Hmm? Um, that's not what I was looking for, because we know that viruses are not composed of cells. So what else? Bacteria. bacteria, right? So remember like the soaps, that antibacterial soap, right? Every, all the scientists have been screaming about that antibacterial soap for forever because we know that when we have too many antibiotic or antibiotics in the environment, the bacteria actually become resistant to them. So the FDA just banned antibacterial soaps, right? So these would be bacteria, okay? So when we look at eukaryotic cells, these would be animals, plants, um, single-celled organisms called prokaryotes, so like amoeba, for example, you might have heard of amoebas before, right? And fungi, so fungi are eukaryotic. So when we looked at the cell in lab last week, you probably drew a cell, right? And inside of it was a darkly staining body, right? And that was the nucleus. So if we look at an animal cell, we have a plasma membrane. What kind of lipids are the plas is the plasma membrane made up of? We study that. The plasma membrane is made up of what type of lipid? We talked about that on Monday. It's not cellulose. Cellulose is the cell wall of plants. We don't have cell walls, um, which is good because that doesn't make us rigid. We're more movable than a plant is. We can move better than a plant. It has a head and a tail. What molecule has a head that's attracted to water and a tail that's repelled by water? Anybody remember that? Phospholipids, right? So this is a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, that's the plasma membrane. Okay. 
That separates inside and outside so that the inside of the cell has a different concentration of stuff, of molecules, than the outside. So it has homeostasis, it has order, okay? This is my nucleus. This is where the DNA is found. So the genetic material in your eukaryotic cells is found in the nucleus. And that's important because it's packaged there so that when a cell needs to divide, we actually have to separate and break down the nucleus and separate the genetic material, okay? So it is separate in the nucleus. And then all of this stuff inside is called cytoplasm. So this is in solution, so there's water. So there's all kinds of proteins, just like that kinesin, the, the guy that was walking, right? There's also a cytoskeleton, right? So we have a cytoskeleton, which is kind of like roads, right? These are proteins. And we also have in the cytoplasm organelles. And these are membrane-bound compartments. So you can think of the eukaryotic cell very much like a factory. So the prokaryotes, the bacteria, do not have a nucleus, and they don't have organelles. So we're going to focus on eukaryotic cells. Okay? Eukaryotic cells are larger. Okay. So they have cytoplasm has a cytoskeleton, and it has organelles. So in your book, there is a diagram of the cell, and you should try to look at it and memorize the parts that we are going to talk about today. So this is the diagram from your cell, or from your textbook. Okay, so notice that it has all kinds of things in the cytoplasm. If the structure is bound by a membrane, right, then it is called an organelle. So an organelle is smaller units of hierarchy than an organ, right? So don't think it's the same thing, organelle, small organ inside the cell, okay? We also see that we have the cytoskeleton. So these little strands, Right, those are like roads, and they help deliver things to and from the different organelles. Right, so thinking of the cell like a um, like a factory. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna skip through the plasma membrane. Okay, so let's look at the organelles. So one organelle in particular is very interesting, and this is what is called the mitochondria. So the mitochondria is where energy is produced. So it functions in ATP production, specifically aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration. So if you remember, we talked about how you can break down glucose in the presence, oops, in the presence of oxygen. And you can get carbon dioxide plus water plus ATP. Okay. So that's aerobic. It is aerobic because it utilizes oxygen. We do have some uh, respiration that is anaerobic. And that produces, when you talk about anaerobic exercise, that means that you're producing um, or you're using ATP so fast that you cannot get enough oxygen, right? So that would be like maybe lifting weights, for example. You're actually not breathing fast enough, and so it's anaerobic um, exercise. And that produces a byproduct called lactic acid. And sometimes that um, can cause problems in the muscles, whereas the muscles get tired, right, and they fatigue. But the aerobic respiration takes place in the mitochondria. Okay? Now the thing about the mitochondria that makes them so interesting is, is that they were once separate prokaryotic cells. So the idea here is, is that when we look at the cells in the um, history of the planet, prokaryotic cells were here first, so bacteria-like organisms. 
And then we get the evolution of eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are larger. And so the idea here is, is that what we think happens is, is that the larger cells engulfed the bacteria-like cells, and then they became part of the, the um, internal um, organelles, the internal system inside of our cell. Okay. So this does not take place now, right? We now um, have these mitochondria that are absolutely fundamental to our life. If we didn't have mitochondria, we wouldn't be here. Okay, so they were once separate prokaryotic cells that became incorporated into larger cells. And the reason why we think this is, is that they have their own DNA. So they have their own genetic material Right. And they are capable of reproducing inside of the cell. Right. So a cell that needs lots of energy, say maybe like several liver, liver cells, they need lots of energy. Kidney cells need lots of energy. They're going to have a lot of mitochondria. And they can get even more because if they need more mitochondria, the mitochondria just reproduce inside their cells, right? Now, the really interesting thing about this mitochondria is it is inherited from your mother only. So all the mitochondria that you have in your body are inherited from your mother only. There's not a lot of DNA. Um, we're going to talk about what genes are, but there's only like 37 genes in the mitochondria. But if we look at um, the egg cell, okay, so this would be my egg cell. This is the nucleus of the egg cell. And then we have all of these little mitochondria floating around. They're kind of like shaped like that. So that's the mitochondria. This is the nucleus, right? So those are my mitochondria. Okay. So if we look at the sperm cell in comparison, it's tiny. I'm not going to be able to draw it as small as I would like to or it needs to be, but it would look something like this. This is the nucleus. It's inside of the head. So that's my nucleus. And then it has this midpiece. This is where the mitochondria are, which help power its um, movement. And then this is the flagella, right? So what happens when the sperm fertilizes the egg is, is that the, the head, this is the head of the sperm, penetrates the egg. And the genetic material from the sperm's nucleus and the egg nucleus come together. So hence they say that half of your genes come from your mother and half from your father, right? But the mitochondria that are in this piece do not make it into the egg, right? So you actually inherit all of your mitochondria from your mother, right? So you only get it from the mother. There's no mitochondria that make it into the, into the egg from the father, okay? So it's kind of interesting because then, because there's not a lot of genetic recombination, they can use it to trace history of people. And so sometimes you might hear of, I have this, it's kind of a bad term, but you see it in the media a lot as mitochondrial E, right? So this is the idea, if we look at my modern mitochondrial and we try to trace it back to where I originated, right? You would be able to more easily trace it back um, then if you were to look at my genetic material in my nucleus, because it's not being combined with anything, right? It's a straight maternal inheritance. You only, it's a matrilineal inheritance, right? So for example, they do this with Native American tribes to look at the relationship between them. They look at the DNA in the mitochondria, okay? Okay, so those are the mitochondria. 
Let's look at another example of a organelle, and this is called the endoplasmic reticulum. And the endoplasmic reticulum is abbreviated ER. Right. So it's inside the cytoplasm, hence the endo means inside, plasm means inside the cytoplasm, and it's a network. So reticulate means to network. So it's a network of, um, of uh, a membrane that's inside of the cytoplasm. And there's two different kinds. Okay, We have what is called the rough ER. The reason why it's called rough is, is that when we look at it underneath an electron microscope, it looks studded. So it looks something like this. Right? And on the surface are these little proteins. Right? And these proteins are called ribosomes. So the ribosomes are proteins. They're not their own organelle. The rough ER is where proteins that are going to be secreted by the cell are produced. So proteins that will be secreted by the cell. So secreted means gotten rid of, right? Like um, removed from the, to the outside of the cell um, are produced here. So specifically on the REF ER. Okay. We also have the smooth ER. Okay. The smooth ER has no roughness, it has no ribosomes. And it has another function. Besides producing proteins, the smooth ER does not produce proteins, it produces lipids it also functions to break down toxins so we'll talk about specialization in cells but like liver cells which specialize in breaking down toxins that we absorb from our um, food um, or like alcohol, um, would have lots of smooth ER in them. Okay. Okay. So that's the endoplasmic reticulum. So if we go back to our cell, okay. Oops. Let's see if I can find myself. It looks like this. Okay. So if we go back to the cell, here is the rough ER. It is attached to the nucleus. So you can always kind of find it really easily because it's next to the nucleus. Okay. You don't need to know everything that is in the nucleus. You just know that that's where the majority of genetic material is stored. Okay. This is the rough ER, right? And then here they show the smooth ER right here, right? And they say it makes the bits. Okay. These little organelles right here are the mitochondria. So they're generally always shaped like this. And they have their own DNA and they're about the size of a bacteria and they can reproduce themselves inside of the cell. So the other organelle that is really important here that we're going to talk about is what is called the Golgi apparatus. Okay. Now, this name does not mean anything. It's just the person who discovered it. All right. So Golgi is a person. The Golgi apparatus, however, functions to produce, produces sugars, and it modifies and packages proteins. That will be secreted by the cell. Right. 
Sometimes it sticks sugars onto proteins and it produces what are called glycoproteins. So a sugar plus a protein is called a glycoprotein. So that glyco, think glucose, think glycogen. Those are all carbohydrates, those are all sugars, right? So glyco just means sugar and then the protein. So we attach the sugars onto the proteins in the Golgi apparatus, okay? So if we look at a diagram from your book that shows how the um, proteins are produced, Remember, the proteins are first produced by, that are being secreted are first produced by the rep ER. Then these proteins are passed into the Golgi apparatus, right? They're modified, right? So that's the Golgi apparatus. Then they're put into these little vesicles. And then the vesicles are transported using those molecular machines that we saw in the video. And then they're transported to the outside of the cell. And then this vesicle diffuses with the outer plasma membrane and things are secreted, okay? So what we're gonna do, very last thing we're gonna do today, is we're gonna talk about um, the production of milk. And so I have a little handout. And this, on one side it's got a specialized mammary gland cell, and the other side it has some information about breast milk versus cow's milk. So mammals are characterized um, by having mammary glands and producing milk to feed their offspring. So is there anybody here that makes cheese? Has ever made cheese from milk? Does anybody know what is the um, major type of protein found in milk? Without milk. Milk protein, what is it called? What type of protein is found in milk? No, lactose is a carbohydrate. Does anybody know? You can look. Now look. So, what is the protein? The curds. So if you've ever made milk, the way that you do it is you take whole milk and then you acidify it, right? And so what happens is, is that some of the proteins denature and they come out of solution. And then you get the curds. So if you've ever bought cheese curds, anybody ever eaten cheese curds? Okay. So this is called casein. So if we look at the proteins, we have casein. This is what cheese curds are. So essentially you acidify, so you lower the pH. Those proteins denature, they come out of solution and they become solid, right? Now in milk that is not pasteurized, there's also lots of other things in, um, that are proteins that are in the milk. So for example, we have enzymes. We have hormones. And what is found in colostrum that is so important? Does anybody know? Colostrum or the first milk. What is in the first milk that is so important to the newborn? Does anybody know? Antibodies. Right? Now when you pasteurize milk, when you heat it up, you denature the enzyme, the hormones, and the antibodies. So pasteurized milk doesn't have any of those things. So we're, we're just talking about like milk that has not been pasteurized. Okay. So those are the proteins. Somebody mentioned lactose. That is the carbohydrate. Right. So lactose is milk sugar. Then lipids, 
right, would include cholesterol. Remember, cholesterol is a steroid. It consists of four carbon rings, and it's the precursor to estrogen and testosterone. But also we have triglycerides. All right, so I'll put steroid for the steroid for the cholesterol. And this is animal fat. Right? So it contains a lot of other things, but primarily proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. Okay. So if you look on the back of your sheet, you'll see a very specialized mammary gland cell. So this is a specialized mammary gland cell. And it's a cell that's currently producing milk. So it's been stimulated by prolactin to start the production of milk. And then milk is released into guts and then transported out through the nipple okay, in most mammals. So if we look at the different parts of this, so the nucleus contains the genetic information, and the genetic information codes for um, protein production. Okay? So here is where we have the rough ER, right? So here's my rough ER. Oops, that's my smooth ER. Here's my rough ER. Okay, those are proteins. Okay, here's my Golgi apparatus, right? This is protein packaging. Okay, so if we think about a factory, at the rough ER, that's the assembly line. We're assembling amino acids to one another to produce proteins. Oh, but we have to ship the proteins out, so we need to package them first, okay? So this is a protein package in a vesicle. So a vesicle is just that membrane-bound structure. So this is the vesicle. So in that video we watched, that little motor protein was carrying that big thing on its back, right? So that was a vesicle, right? So it would need to transport the vesicle to the outside of the plasma membrane and then it releases it. So this is the protein that is secreted to the outside. So that would be like casein, that would be like enzymes, that would be like hormones, all secreted, okay? Then if you look at the smoothie R here, you see the smoothie R is producing lipids, right? So, That's the lipid production, right? And so the lipids are produced, and the lipids can just be secreted to the outside without packaging. So they just get transported via the cytoskeleton to the outside, and then they just kind of use the outer membrane, and then just might worry about the lipids. They just can move right across the plasma membrane easily, whereas proteins cannot. Okay. Okay, so the one thing that's not shown in here is the lactose. So, actually it is shown. Sugar is synthesized. Okay, so here it shows protein and sugar-laden vesicles move to the plasma membrane. So remember that the Golgi apparatus also produces sugar. So you want to put sugar production and it is shipped out there. So we say Golgi apparatus, protein production, packaging plus, Sugar production, there we go. Okay. So that is a specialized mammary gland cell. Okay. Interestingly, even males have the genes to produce milk. They pass the genes on to their female offspring, which could eventually, and their male offspring, which could eventually use them. That those genes are never turned on because they do not have the proper hormones to turn the genes on. But it was kind of interesting because a few, maybe a couple, maybe 10 years ago, they discovered that there were some fruit bats in the Amazon where the males were act actually lactating. 
And what they discovered is, is that the food that the fruit bats was eating was high in protein, excuse me, and hormone mimicking um, molecules. So the fruits had molecules in them that mimicked uh, female hormones, and it actually caused the, the male bats to lactate. But generally, we male, males do not lactate in males. Okay, so we'll talk more about breast milk and um, this handout on Monday. So you might want to bring this handout back, put it in your notes. And I'll see some of you today in lab.